Hi, I'm Robert Tolpe, and today we're talking about SPARC, the largest genetic study of autism ever conducted. It seeks to discover specific genes associated with the development of autism spectrum disorder, and has partnered with healthcare providers across the U.S. to recruit tens of thousands of families for genetic testing. While the study is no doubt revolutionary, I am quite concerned about its implications. As pre-implantation genetic testing becomes more advanced, studies such as SPARC will provide the data that enable diagnosis of some cases of autism before a person is born. What is even more concerning is that gene editing technologies will one day make it possible to alter an embryo's DNA, allowing scientists to eliminate genetic differences associated with autism to significantly reduce the chances of a baby being born with a disorder. I imagine that many parents will choose to use these services to ensure what, in their minds, would give their child the brightest future possible. It seems that we are heading towards a future with significantly less autistic people. So let's talk about that, shall we? Spark launched in early 2016 with the goal of finding specific genes linked to autism. The Simons Foundation, which funds the study, recruited some of the best geneticists in the field to lead it. Spark's principal investigator, Dr. Wendy Chung, has an impressive track record. She is a board-certified clinician and geneticist with over 20 years of experience. Dr. Chung has received multiple awards and has authored countless peer-reviewed papers. Her specialty is hunting down the genes that make us sick. She has researched the genetic causes of obesity, hypertension, and diabetes, among other conditions. And her latest target is autism spectrum disorder. Over the course of five years, Dr. Chung's team has linked in excess of 100 genes to autism as part of the SPARC study. It's clear that a lot of progress has been made here. But what next? Well, this is where Spark isn't very clear about the direction the research appears to be taking. They talk of the potential for targeted medicines for people with certain genetic markers for autism, but for the most part, their goals appear nebulous, at least from the point of view of an outside observer who isn't a geneticist such as myself. I question, as the study continues to collect all this data, what will it be used for? Well, it appears that the most important impact Spark may have is that it may very well produce the data required to formulate a genetic test for certain cases of autism. There is a stipulation there. The reason why I said certain cases of autism is because autism is not 100% heritable. If it were, identical twins who share roughly the same set of DNA would have autism nearly 100% of the time instead of just 77% of the time. Studies show that a lot of cases of autism are caused by both unknown and known factors that happen predominantly during fetal development. This is not to say that autism isn't highly heritable in certain cases. The presence of some genes can indicate that someone has autism with startling accuracy. It is those genes that could have serious implications. Even with current sequencing technologies, it's possible to screen for these genes quite easily, although it's not very cheap or quick to do so. But it's certainly a lot cheaper and quicker than it used to be. Starting in 1990, it took researchers over 10 years and more than $2 billion to sequence the human genome. These days, you can send your sample to a private company and receive your entire DNA sequence back in a few months for the cost of less than $1,000. And these tests are only getting more affordable and less time-consuming. The impact of this is that one day, using Spark's research, scientists may be able to create an accurate test for highly heritable forms of autism. This could, of course, be miraculous for early intervention when treating autism. If autism is diagnosed at a young enough age, certain therapies can greatly improve the social skills that many people with autism struggle with. This is the kind of thing that doctors such as Wendy Chung dream of. They want a future with no more guesswork and quick treatment for their patients. However, many more things can be done with a genetic test. I'll refer to this graphic Dr. Chung used in a presentation she gave about genomic medicine. This graph was adopted from a survey of doctors who were asked questions about the value of genetic testing. According to the graph, the most valuable tests are those that inform reproductive decisions and life planning and inform disease management and prevention. It doesn't take a genius to figure out what reproductive decisions and prevention mean in the case of autism. It means preventing autistic people from being born. That's the easiest way to prevent an inborn condition such as autism from occurring. This is most effectively accomplished during IVF treatments, where you can screen embryos for genes associated with autism before implantation. 
Other tests could potentially determine whether an already pregnant person is carrying a fetus with genes associated with autism, such that they could decide whether or not they want to have the baby. If you think people will not make use of these technologies if they become available, you'd be wrong. In Iceland, a country with a population of over 300,000 people, only one or two babies each year are born with Down syndrome. That's because the vast majority of people there screen for the condition, and nearly 100% of those whose fetuses test positive choose not to carry on with the pregnancy. Obviously, a decision like that is incredibly personal, but we have to recognize that it is one that people will make. I'm sure many of you are thinking, what's the big deal? Autism can be a debilitating disorder. If we can reduce the chances of people being born with autism, then shouldn't we? That question really opens up a can of worms. It's an especially difficult question to be asked in the case of autism because the disorder presents itself in so many different ways. A concept critical to understanding autism is that it is a spectrum. While some people living with autism do indeed experience debilitating symptoms, others do not. So how do you determine who has symptoms severe enough to make their life not worth living, if that's even a decision you want to make in the first place? There is also a question of what motivates such a decision. People with disabilities face a lot of prejudice. Are these choices being made out of compassion for the disabled, or are they being made out of prejudice? There's also the question of whether parents can really make a thoroughly informed decision, as genetic sequencing tests require advanced degrees to fully understand the implications of their results. To illustrate these points, and to especially show how autism differs from other conditions, let's imagine two scenarios. In our first scenario, a pregnant person and their partner are told by their doctor after taking a prenatal test that they will give birth to a child with Tay-Sachs disease, and that their child will not live past their fifth birthday. They will be born healthy, but their nervous system will deteriorate slowly. They will have seizures, they will go blind, and they won't be able to communicate as their brain is attacked by fatty substances called gangliosides that their body can't break down. These parents choose not to have the baby. In this case, the prognosis is clear. The baby will die a very unpleasant death, and it's quite easy for the parents to understand that. I don't think that many people would disagree with their decision not to put a kid through that experience. Now imagine a second scenario, where a concerned pregnant person pays a private company to sequence their fetus's DNA such that it can be scrutinized by doctors. The parents receive vast amounts of data that is difficult to understand. Some results indicate that their fetus has genetic markers associated with autism, but because these parents aren't doctors, they don't quite know the extent of the risk associated with these markers, and it's difficult for the doctors to communicate to them how these genes may affect their child's life. Not wanting to take any risks in their pregnancy, they choose not to have the baby. In this case, the prognosis is not clear. Because autism presents in many different ways, it's really hard to know the full extent of someone's symptoms before their birth, while other conditions may cause undue hardship. In many scenarios, it would be difficult to say that someone is suffering from autism. A lot of people with autism self-report that they live wonderful, fulfilling lives. So making a case that not having the baby is in the infant's best interest is unconvincing. The decision to terminate is largely because the parents do not want to or aren't equipped to care for a child with higher support needs. This is a personal decision, and I would understand why, for instance, a single parent working 40 hours a week at minimum wage may not be able to care for a special needs child. In the case of severe disability, this is understandable though it is a band-aid of a solution to the much larger problem of inadequate childcare and healthcare for lower income kids. But what about cases where parents who are more than equipped to take care of a child are told that their kid, as opposed to having a severe disability, will have a form of autism with lower support needs, or that their child may just be less intelligent or less able-bodied than other children? What if they choose not to continue with the pregnancy? This is where things get much more dicey. I understand that parents desire only the best for their kids and want to give them the best opportunities in life. For many parents, that means having a physically and mentally fit kid. If they choose for their unborn child or embryos to undergo genetic testing, the tests might reveal far more than just severe disabilities.
For example, Dr. Wendy Chung explains how Sparks research uncovered that a certain gene is associated with lower IQs in the subjects tested when compared to the IQs of their parents and siblings. What we found out is that our study participants, they were smarter than average, if you will. They had an IQ of about 110 on average for these parents and, and children, other siblings that didn't have 16p. And when we looked at the individuals with 16p, we still saw this normal distribution, but instead we saw it shifted downward about 1.7 standard deviations. So imagine a geneticist like Dr. Chung telling a parent that their child could have an IQ more than 20 points lower than theirs. What would the implication be if a parent made reproductive decisions to avoid having a kid with that gene? I feel like a decision such as that would be firstly ill-informed. Dr. Chung's research indicates that the IQ of these patients was on average around 85, if I remember anything from college statistic class. That's not within the realm of intellectual disability. It's within the low average range according to the WACE 4 IQ classification scale. Making reproductive decisions to try and eliminate that gene wouldn't be based on genuine concern for someone's mental health. It would simply be a decision made out of prejudice towards people with low IQs. One could argue that parents only want the best for their kids, which is why they would pursue genetic testing and therapies to choose the most advantageous characteristics. But what characteristics might those be? Are we just going to eliminate any characteristics that society is prejudiced against? It is a fact supported by piles of data that attractive, white, able-bodied male individuals are on average given vastly more opportunities than other people. This is based not off of them being somehow better than other people, but simply because society is prejudiced towards everyone else. As testing becomes more advanced, should parents screen for physical attractiveness, skin color, agility, or sex? Should parents not only test for these traits, but use other technologies to ensure that their kid is to their liking? Now is the time to talk about gene editing technology. While screenings are effective at filtering out most undesirable characteristics, Precision gene editing technologies, such as CRISPR-Cas9, could alter the genetic sequence of a zygote to the point of changing any gene down to a single mutation. Using data collected by studies such as SPARC, you could find all the genes associated with autism and rectify them to simply reduce your child's chances of having the disorder. While you're at it, you can give your child a high IQ, make them tall, blonde-haired, blue-eyed, you name it. Of course, these technologies will initially be very expensive and will only be available to the rich. Society could become even more unequal than it already is, as wealthy, genetically modified children receive more opportunities than non-genetically modified individuals because they have traits that make them appear superior to other people. Underprivileged people would be even more disproportionately affected by disability and, as we know in places including the United States, there aren't enough safety nets to help disabled people who are uninsured unhoused or unemployed. I know I sound like I'm screaming, the world is ending on a soapbox, but I see history repeating itself before my eyes. During the early 20th century, a pseudoscientific discipline known as eugenics rose to popularity. People at the time had the unfounded concern that poor people and Eastern European immigrants were causing damage to the gene pool. Out of sheer prejudice with no evidence whatsoever, they labeled these people as unfit and began a campaign to stop them from reproducing. Prominent eugenicists and eugenic societies pushed for legislation that allowed the government to sterilize people without their consent, who they deemed to be too unintelligent or too physically disabled to contribute to society. Due to prejudice, those most impacted by these policies were women of color. After the rise of a, a certain political party in Germany that loved eugenics during the 1930s and 40s, these practices started to become unpopular, although some sterilization programs lasted until the 1960s. Though old school eugenics has fallen out of favor, what has not disappeared is the ableism that fueled the concept. Sure, the pseudoscience has been discredited, but what replaced it is advanced technologies that can theoretically, one day, bring the dreams of 20th century eugenicists to life, and those dreams are still alive and well in today's medical community. Just as eugenicists of the past desired to eliminate disability and increase mental and physical fitness, many doctors today seek to use new gene editing technologies to accomplish the same things. Some prominent medical ethicists have argued that this is a natural step in the advancement of the human race, but what advancement is really being made here? For some debilitating genetic conditions, such as Tay-Sachs, current technologies have spared many people from experiencing horrible pain and suffering. 
But for other conditions, such as certain cases of autism, the main reason why these autistic people face so much hardship is because society treats them like garbage. Wouldn't a better solution to increasing collective happiness be to put in the effort not to treat people like garbage, as opposed to trying to erase disability from the face of the earth? I know no matter what people say, this technology will come into use, but it's important to at least recognize the future we will live in. That doesn't seem to be what Spark is doing. I feel like they know exactly what doctors are going to do with their data, but when people call them out on the fact that they really aren't addressing the possible consequences of their research, they simply say that critics don't understand what Spark is doing. They chalk these reactions from the autistic community up to a miscommunication between researchers and concerned autistic people. I'm a little confused by this assessment. What I'm seeing is not a miscommunication, but rather a complete and utter disconnect between what these researchers say to the public and what they say to each other. To give an example, remember that graph I showed that Dr. Chung used in her presentation promoting Spark to a conference of doctors? The graph identifies reproductive decisions and prevention as key goals when creating diagnostic genetic tests. This implies the use of genetic counseling, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, and prenatal screenings to significantly reduce the chances of a child being born with autism. While Spark's principal investigator is using a graph such as that in a room full of other doctors, the organization on Twitter is pushing out information graphics that are much more vague. This one simply states that genetic diagnoses are useful to provide a roadmap for the future. What does that mean? This behavior feels duplicitous, as it appears that Spark is telling two very different stories to different segments of the population. This raises questions about informed consent. Spark always brings the possibility of gene therapies and targeted medicine to the forefront in their advertising, but those ideas seem fairly far in the future with current technology. It almost seems like they're selling some kind of autism cure, mainly to parents who eagerly submit their kids' DNA for testing, when most of the papers the study is producing are related to the heritability of autism and which genes cause what symptoms. I wonder if these parents would have participated if they knew that there was a possibility that their kids' DNA could be used to ensure that other kids like them are never born. I hope I'm not grossly misrepresenting what Spark is doing. I know at least some of the people in the organization have their hearts in the right place and might just be excessively optimistic about the future. Dr. Wendy Chung has outright stated that she doesn't even think parents would even want to prenatally screen for autism. Let me also be very clear that this is not something that uh, in many cases for many individuals with autism, I wouldn't see any reason to do any sort of genetic selection against something like that. I think there are many wonderful people that um, I think are incredible people who happen to have autism in terms of a behavioral trait, but I don't think this is something that um, people would want to do necessarily genetic screening for. Again, my point being is that there's a wide range in terms of the spectrum. Um, so this is not, not about eugenics. She has appeared in media interviews before, saying she has otherwise healthy and happy patients with certain genetic conditions who wouldn't have been born if their parents opted not to have them after a genetic screening. Because of this, Dr. Chung seriously questions if parents should even screen for some genetic conditions at all. I still think that Spark raises a lot of ethical dilemmas, and there are many hurdles to overcome in dealing with them. So. What is the solution to the question of spark and autism? Should we petition to end the study? Should we outlaw certain prenatal screenings and gene editing technologies? I say none of the above. Spark's research could actually result in easier diagnosis and treatment of autism, which could help vast amounts of people. As for prenatal screenings, denying reproductive health care never goes down well and quickly becomes restrictive of bodily autonomy. Finally, gene editing technologies can help people with debilitating conditions. Banning them would just limit access to these technologies for those who need them. Additionally, I sincerely doubt the use of gene editing technologies would stop if using them was banned. Research would just go underground, which would mean that studies would be unregulated entirely, which could cause 
all kinds of problems. It appears there is no easy fix to these issues. Preventing this world from looking like a dystopian young adult novel will no doubt require a massive shift in public perception of the disabled and what it means to live a meaningful life. Considering that Spark is playing such a large role into moving us towards a dystopian future, they better have a good game plan to maximize the benefits of their study while minimizing the problems it could cause. Anyways, I'm Robert Tolpe, and if you like this video, don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe, and maybe even check out my Patreon if you'd like to support the channel, and I hope you have a wonderful week. Bye-bye!